This season of The Crown, I think, is particularly thrilling because it introduces Diana. I think when you're talking about Diana, it's really important to remember she got married at the age of 20 and she passed away at the age of 36. So she had this sort of 16 year, very intense period in the global spotlight. And she was young. She was figuring out as she went and she was using clothing to empower her. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Holmes. I'm a journalist and the creator of So Many Thoughts on Instagram, where I parse the royal fashion of the Duchess of Cambridge and the Duchess of Sussex. You probably know them as Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle. I am also now the author of a new book called HRH, So Many Thoughts on Royal Style, which looks at the fashion of Kate and Meghan, along with the Queen and Diana. So we're coming out of season three, which was the fashion of the 70s. It was a little bit sort of darker and more subdued from the Queen's perspective, certainly. And then, you know, burst onto the scene, Diana, when she met Charles and then through their courtship and the early years of their marriage. And what's so exciting from a fashion perspective is the costumes are recognizable. They're from, you know, the outfits that we all saw Diana wear and live on in iconic photographs that we see today. I think what's really important to understand about royal dressing is just how thoughtful it is, how purposeful it is. They use their fashion as part of their jobs. They are not celebrities with agencies to wear whatever they want. They are working in service of the crown. Now, members of the royal family, they don't give deep personal interviews. They don't give big revealing speeches. What they do is make appearances. And the royal women understand that and they use this attention to their advantage. So they pick what they wear very carefully, the brands that they support, the colors that they wear, it's all designed to send a message. So fashion this season, I think, takes center stage, and that's because of how important it was to Diana. I mean, she was not necessarily all that fashionable before she entered the royal family, and you see that in the crown, you see sort of a grumpy teenager, and then she sort of transforms, and the power that she derived from that and the amount of attention that she got from that is a big part of her legacy. On the season of the crown, you see her in those early years, you know, I mean, again, she was not the fashion icon that we all remember now. She was a teenager girl from an aristocratic family, so certainly very well to do. You know, she wore longer skirts and sort of fluffy sweaters and some of her clothes were a little ill-fitting. There's a scene or, with a montage of Diana where it kind of runs through some of her early famous fashion. Well, so unlike uh, today's royals that we watch, Charles and Diana were not photographed together until they announced their engagement. And that blue suit that she bought off the rack, the crown recreates it beautifully. I think it, it shows how much she was longing to be taken seriously and look the part. She uh, had no experience um, in the public eye the way that he certainly did. And so you see those pictures of them announcing their engagement and you see her sort of uncertainty and you see it sort of represented in this sort of like ill-fitting but like brightly colored suit that is meant to you know match her engagement ring. Early on Diana worked with a couple editors from British Vogue and they helped her sort of understand the clothing and the language of clothing and what worked for her and what would work for her job. So she learned all of that and then sort of went on her own. She forged many friendships with designers and would hang out with them and be sort of a collaborative part of the process. What I also love is that, you know, back then there was no push for the relatability that we see from the royals today. You know, Kate and Meghan, they know that people are keeping tabs on their wardrobe and how much of it is designer and how much of it is mass. And back in Diana's day, people wanted a princess. They expected a princess and she delivered on that. Well, when you think about Diana's wedding dress, I mean, she was a young girl becoming the princess of Wales, you know, marrying an heir to the throne. And she wanted a princess dress and my God, she got it. I mean, those big sleeves, the bows, the lace, the sparkles, you know I mean? It was all there. Some of the most iconic memories that live in my mind forever are the wedding dresses. I mean, you can close your eyes and picture it. It takes me right back to see Meghan in Givenchy or Kate in Alexander McQueen. Those are the fairy tales brought to life. And you look back and again, it's hard not to think about everything that's happened since. But on that day and in that moment, people were just enthralled with it. They just, you know, became instantly iconic. And I do think of all the royal wedding dresses, that's the one where you can place in time exactly. <laughs> you look at that dress and you think, yes, that was 1981. So the designers looked up what was the longest royal wedding train and they wanted one that was longer. <laughs> And they wanted to make a statement and they wanted to make sure that Diana, um, when she walked down the aisle, really, you know, made her presence known. The Crown does a beautiful job recreating that to really wonderful and dramatic effect. I think, again, 
that dress is so well known uh, that they had to show it and they had to recreate it really uh, precisely without giving too much spoilers. It does sort of tee up all of the drama that is to come, that back shot with that long train. So unlike the queen who tends to pick a couple of designers and work with them very closely on bespoke pieces, Diana sort of shopped around and she made friends with a lot of designers and she wore a whole range of, of people and labels and I think this was part of the fun for her. And I think therein lies sort of the exciting part about Diana's evolution. You know, I mean, it's not like she's somebody who came in, you know, understanding all of this stuff. She grew and evolved in the public spotlight. One of the most sort of amazing things is that, you know, everybody in the royal family thought perhaps as the excitement around her built towards the wedding that after the wedding it would sort of die down a little bit and it didn't you know it kept going and everybody was still interested in her and a big part of that was because of her clothing so a big sort of theme of this season is diana's popularity and the amount of attention and coverage that she got and one of my favorite quotes in my book is from a photographer who said even if we didn't care about the engagement or the cause that diana was supporting we'd show up to see what she's wearing i mean she wasn't giving these big personal speeches. She wasn't giving big interviews. You don't hear her talk in a lot of these montage shots. She's just interacting with the crowd. And certainly, you know, the ways in which she embraced them and, and the public embraced her sort of set the groundwork for her legacy. As the season goes on and as the episodes sort of progress, you see Charles and the Queen <laughs> just grapple with this attention and, and try and understand it and then begin certainly to resent it and try and, you know, uh, keep her in her place. And, you know, obviously there's just no doing that. Diana was a, a phenomenon. I think she understood that she needed to stand out and certainly in those early years really embraced that. It helped certainly that the, in the 80s um, these things were trending. <laughs> Dynasty Die is some of my favorite fashion of hers. And I think you, you see Diana kind of like working it out, figuring out what works well for her and then getting increasingly more daring in her style choices as you know um, her marriage became more troubled. So this season of The Crown really hammers home the point that Diana was on her own. You know, I mean, she's sort of um, adrift in, in Buckingham Palace looking for, you know, a connection with the queen or companionship from her husband and she wasn't getting that and she increasingly sought it elsewhere and I think again her fashion plays a big part in that. I think what's so important to remember about royal life is all the things you cannot do. You see her sort of find real power in in independence, find a real voice in what she was wearing. You see in the season of the crown like her wardrobe just keeps building and building to more and more sort of a beautiful place and um, you know, catching a glimpse of the Spencer family tiara in one episode was so exciting. The season sort of builds to the late 80s when their marriage was damaged beyond repair, but it was made very clear by the queen that divorce was not an option. So these were two people, Charles and Diana, that needed to stay together, even though they had no desire to. <laughs> Charles, you know, resents her and Diana is craving his attention, but is clearly very hurt by him. And you see her fashion grow more sophisticated in response to that. You know, I mean, she is um, more mature and has a greater sense of her power within the marriage. And you see her in more streamlined suits and certainly without giving anything away, the, the final scene, it's not necessarily about what she's wearing. And I think that was what Diana herself wanted. You know, she understood early on that fashion was very powerful. And then she sort of sought to rise above that. I think if you look at Diana as she enters the 90s and it becomes more clear to the public that her marriage is in trouble, I mean, this is when things got pretty ugly in the tabloids, that she used fashion again to her advantage. I mean, she knew all along what she could do with clothes and she chose at very sort of specific points to lean into it or lean out. She was trying very hard to craft an image uh, that she wanted and it was often you know, competing one with Charles. One of the looks that I think about a lot is she gave a speech saying she was stepping back from public life, that media attention was overwhelming, and she wore, it was actually emerald green, but it looked sort of black. Um, it looked very serious. And then, you know, you swing the pendulum to the other extreme, and you have the infamous revenge dress. So the evening that a documentary aired in which Charles admitted he had been unfaithful, you know, Diana was scheduled to appear that night, and I think a lot of people would have canceled that appearance, but not Diana. She reached into the back of her closet and chose this off-the-shoulder, above-the-knee 
sexy little black dress. Nothing about the dress was scandalous, but seeing it on a member of the royal family and seeing that much skin, <laughs> frankly, um, was so exciting and and helped her reclaim her position in this narrative because it became not just about Charles being unfaithful, but look, you know, look at Diana and the papers the next day had her picture there too. So in the mid nineties, when the divorce proceedings started, you can see Diana sort of expressing more of her individuality. So she started wearing short dresses to evening events, which again, is not that big of a deal, but for a member of the royal family, it was. She was finding herself. She was a woman in her mid thirties who um, had lived her whole adult life in the public eye and within the confines of the royal family and finally had a little freedom to play around. And she looked fantastic. Some of the most memorable ones are her most casual, walking to and from the gym in a sweatshirt and bike shorts. She was wearing beautifully fitted, beautifully tailored, brightly colored pieces. And they're very timeless in a way that certainly her early fashion was not. And then it all sort of builds to this moment where she auctions off her clothes. You know, that's kind of an incredible thing. If you think about Kate or Megan doing that today, taking some of their most famous dresses and selling them, you know, I mean, in New York of all places, went with this narrative that she was, she no longer wanted to be seen as a clothes horse. She wanted to be seen as a workhorse. She wanted the focus to be on her humanitarian work. And, um, you know, the final images of her life are the ones that I remember the most are, you know, where she's walking in a minefield in a white button down shirt and khaki pants and loafers, you know what I mean? That's so relatable and so um, much not about the fashion. And I think that's a really important point of all of this because if there's no clothing to talk about, you're still gonna talk about Diana, but you're gonna talk about what she's doing, what she's saying. When I watch Megan's fashion, I see a lot of Diana because Megan, again, you know, when she came onto the scene, everybody had been following Kate for a long time. Kate's style, especially in those early years, was classic and feminine and not particularly envelope pushing. And here comes Megan, who is extremely savvy, who is very accomplished, had worked with a costume designer on set and knew the language of clothing and tried to sort of infuse her own um, sort of spirit into what we think of as sort of traditional royal attire. And then Perhaps where I see most of Diana in Meghan is um, when they've left the royal family. So after after March, when they walked away and, and moved to North America, first Canada and then um, Los Angeles, Meghan sort of stepped back from fashion. And that reminded me of, you know, the, that, that final period in Diana's life where she just took a break from it. I think Diana will forever be a fashion legacy. And I think the ways in which people today and especially younger generations have adopted her style, you know, the Hailey Bieber spread in um, French Vogue, uh, it just shows the power of what Diana wore and how much um, people relate to it today and how exciting it still is. You know I mean? I don't think um, that today's royal fashion has the same sort of envelope pushing or perhaps even spirit that Diana did. You know, I mean, you see her individuality and her cheekiness in her choices. She did something uh, within her very short and jam-packed time that few could do. And her clothing was a big part of that.